Now on ITV1, a change to our advertised programme. This is Going Home. It's a tribute to the late John Peel, who of course sadly died earlier this week. Going home to the place you remember Going back home again To a childhood scene Holding memories Going home, going home, going home I don't feel that um, I'm still rooted in, in the house that I grew up in. I feel this is where I'm rooted. Uh, we've been here for 30-something years now and all of our children grew up here. Maybe I'm hoping to go back to come to terms with some of the things about my childhood that I didn't much care for. But then I'd just be interested to see how much it's changed. Well, I suppose my very earliest memories of the house are wartime memories. Well, these are, these are all at the house. Francis uh, on the rocking horse, me on the rocking horse. Amongst the first things that we were ever taught, were in, and not taught things like you know, cats, dogs, ducks, cat, and all that sort of thing, we were actually taught aircraft recognition. And uh, there was one of my very earliest memories is of going with my brother Francis, who could barely walk at the time, actually. He's very young indeed. So I was probably five, and he was three or four and two, I don't remember, no, it must have been four and two almost, I think, and uh, we went to the top of the garden and we'd been told not to go into the top half of the garden because it's roughly the size and uh, shape of a football pitch, as I recall, and there was a path that ran effectively along the halfway line and we were told not to go into the top half of the garden. And uh, on this occasion I went up there and I said to Francis, uh, I'm going to go into the top half of the garden. And he expressed, he probably couldn't even speak at the time, but he expressed uh, in some way disapproval. And I, showing the bravery of the elder brother, stepped into the top half of the garden. And as I did, a German plane flew over the garden. <laughs> so uh, uh, we recognised it, obviously, from the black crosses on the wings. So I thought, you know, whatever I've been told is right. I mustn't go into the top half of the garden. And barely went into the top half of the garden for the whole of the rest of the time that we lived there as a consequence. <laughs> I spent a lot of time as a child up trees where nobody could get at me. There were little kind of secret places. It was those places that I really missed, the ability to kind of get lost in somewhere familiar, you know, to hide yourself. Here's a... Uh, picture of the house looking uh, impressively bleak actually and there's the flagpole there from which uh, again I tell people we flew the Union Jack throughout the whole of the uh, Second World War but there's conspicuously no <laughs> Union Jack on the flagpole. I think it was the winter of 1941 and there's what was called the big lawn because it was a lawn quite big. We were very imaginative children. Um, so oh, there's the flag. That must have been us flying at half mast. That was when the king died. We were all very upset by the death of uh, George the Sixth, not because he was king, but because he seemed like a decent bloke. Um, and also, I remember being very impressed by his wartime speech in 1941. This famous "A man stood at the gate of the year" speech when he was fighting his stammer. Here's one of the very rare pictures of uh, my dad uh, holding me on his uh, aerial motorbike and in his uh, military uniform. Now that's me and my mum. I look like a little girl, I was really cute. I got a, a mass of golden bubbles and uh, wearing a little skirt. Um, it's amazing, I'm not more screwed up than I am, really. Uh, there's my dad in his uniform again. See, these are things which I, of course, obviously don't remember at all because uh, in my head uh, I never saw my dad at all until I was uh, six years old. 
one afternoon, um, as I remember it, uh, uh, Francis and I were playing in the garden and we heard a motorbike coming down the road and rushed out to watch it go by. But it didn't go by. The, the rider signalled for a left turn and turned into the driveway, which is a kind of gravel driveway around a central piece of grass. And uh, as he was making his way in a gingerly fashion uh, around the gravel, a very dangerous motorcyclist will know, um, we ran into the house, or I ran into the house, and upstairs to my mother was washing her hair in a sink, it had a window overlooking the driveway, and uh, I said to her, Mummy, Mummy, there's a funny-looking man at the door. And uh, she looked out of the window, and, as I remember, it burst into tears and said, That's your father. And uh, so I rushed back downstairs again and told Francis, and uh, again, as I remember, we just stood there kind of looking at him, looking at him and thinking, as he sort of took off his motorcycling gear and I thought so that's what a father looks like uh, my mother uh, used to spend a lot of time um, in her bedroom reading romantic fiction uh, she would say superior romantic fiction but romantic fiction nevertheless and we were raised by Nanny uh, who was no who was Mrs uh, Miss Florence Horn uh, which is why our daughter's called Florence who was known as Trader Horn, after the famous sea captain of Victorian era. Um, and Trader was the person around who our lives revolve. This is uh, Trader, and Trader, and Trader, and Trader, and Trader. But you notice that uh, my mother is in very few of these pictures, and that uh, Trader is always the one who's like looking after us. But the, the only time my father ever beat me, which he, he did in a very formal kind of uh, old-fashioned way, he uh, gave me a, a good talking to, and then uh, with his uh, captain's swagger stick, uh, he gave me four strokes on my backside. And uh, that didn't help our relationship, I'll be honest. My mother, on the other hand, was a great, was a great enthusiast for capital... Uh, not capital punishment, for corporal punishment. Capital punishment, she stopped just short of that, thank God. No, but there are probably more, actually, in, in, in this book here. Um, extraordinary. There's a girl here called D Dindy Blackledge, and whatever became of her, because she, when I, for my seventh birthday, gave me an adjustable spanner, and I thought it was the most extraordinary. I was, in fact, I, I only lost it about ten years ago, uh, but I thought it was a ima very imaginative and extraordinary gift to give a seven-year-old, and I adored it, because it was great for playing with, you know, um, as... as sort of metal tools often are. So, Dindy, thank you. Later on in life, my dad compelled me to join a kind of middle-class football club called the Liverpool Ramblers, and uh, where everybody dressed in cavalry twill trousers and suede shoes and sports jackets and knitted ties. And I went along and played a couple of times and absolutely hated it, really for the same reasons that I got into rock and roll and, and you know, sort of, popular music generally, was because uh, it was something that my parents and their friends and the, the people that I was supposed to want to associate with who I hated, I could give you some names now, people whose names still scarred on my heart, uh, who, are, who are held up to me as examples of the kind of people that I should want to spend my time with or, or, or to emulate in some way, and they were just total bastards and they probably still are, I hated them. So you used to have those awful conversations. Who would you rather died, you know, mum or trader? And uh, invariably we used to say, my mother, because trader, um, she was, I suppose, uneducated, you know, uh, really, but she didn't need to be because she was just... Uh, she was so kind of warm and protecting that uh, uh, obviously it didn't matter to you that she didn't know what the capital of Peru was. Um, and uh, she had a, a range of sisters and friends in Liverpool who could become kind of secretly friends of yours as well. And there were people that, you know, your parents didn't know. There was a sister, they all had wonderful names. There was, was there a Phyllis? They, were, they all had the sort of names which people don't have anymore. I mean, how long has it been since you met a Phyllis? I imagine the house will have changed virtually beyond recognition, but I'm hoping to spot things in the garden. 
because I was quite apprehensive about this. And Sheila, actually being the, the wiser of the two of us, she said, it might do you good, you know, to sort of lay ghosts and so on and get it out of your system once and for all. Go away, go away, go away.